How oh, are I'm, you? How's I'm it going? Good, man. I've never met you before, man. I've never met you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, I have him really enjoyed your work. Uh, congrats on everything. Let me start with the, how's the road been? I mean, after a couple, after a little bit of forced time off, how's the road? How's it been back on the road? Uh, it's a little bit odd. Yeah. Um, yeah, physically and and mentally. I, I voice this with a few other musicians who are sort of on the same page. It's it's a, it, it, That's a long time to be off. And, and it just doesn't feel, I think when you go back at it, you think, oh, okay, this is going to feel like it did, and it doesn't. Yeah. Um, so it, it all sort of stems for me, uh, if it's going to work, whether my voice is working. Even though I don't consider myself a singer, I, I never really have. I, I like... But that's the thing that has to be together for me because if it if it's not, then I'm really working for my for my gas money, and uh, so it's it's been good because I've been working out at home with that. So yeah, how is touring? Just in terms of what you have to do to keep yourself going, or like what it feels like after the show, like now compared to back when you were in your 30s and 40s. Oh well, sure, it's a bit more of an effort, but it's it's parts of it are are i always like to surround myself with good people and great mu good musicians that are good hangs i mean that's that's what you're doing most of the time you're on stage maybe a couple hours yeah 90 minutes but the rest of the time you're in airports you're in hotels you're waiting in lobbies i call it the theory of forward alignment you're always facing the same way you're in a van facing the same way <laughs> you're in an airplane facing the same way that's time to get band pictures you're all facing the same way <laughs> you're on stage facing the same way so it's like is that weird maybe <laughs> yeah it's a now that i think about it it's a very weird thing to do with all your friends <laughs> well it's a weird thing to notice yeah is what, <laughs> the theory of forward alignment that's i love right. that so much but you're taking care of yourself obviously i mean i guess in the old days of, i mean i talked to flea from the red hot chili peppers one time and he said man there's so much green tea and brown rice and kale on my rider now com oh. compared to back when i was in my 20s you know yeah we don't have that <laughs> I, we, we hear about it in other bands dressing rooms we're playing with like Oh, we want the organic blueberries. It's like, no, we still have wings and pizza after. I, there's something about salt, fat, and sugar after a performance that I still like. And that may be contributed to the fact that I had a heart attack five years ago. <laughs> yeah. but, but who knows, you know? <laughs> uh, and is your, your son's on the road with you now, too? Is yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, how that happened, he was on the road with me um, just kind of hanging out. He's my older son. And... Um, he had, had a business degree at Ryerson here in, in Toronto. And then one night, uh, tragically, my sound man, road manager, got killed in a car accident right before. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was, he was a lovely guy. And uh, right before we were going to Yellowknife. And I said, do you want to step in? You have this business thing going on and, you know, learn how to do the settlements and stuff. So he did. And people immediately, buyers, promoters, and all the people on the show just fell in love with this guy every show and watching him at an airport check a band in he's like totally keeps his cool i'm back there getting up tight all the time like started to chew my nails and going wow this is really taking a long time like they have oh no that's is that overweight oh i see him pulling out his credit cards does this mean we're being charged and he's just like keeps his cool through the whole time goes up does his thing gets it through all the time so. it must be meaningful to you to have him on oh, the road i'm so too. proud man i just even the last time coming back from newfoundland i, I it, I said, you're my hero, man. Just, I'm just watching you do all that. It's just amazing. So. so this is your first album in 13 years. You produced it with Greg Wells, mm -hmm. who is, has worked with the likes of Adele and Taylor Swift and Keith Urban, um, originally from Peterborough. They're living in Newfoundland now, I think, right? No, no. He just bought a church in Newfoundland. In Newfoundland his right. father was a, was a minister, and um, so was his grandfather. And no, Greg Wells lives in Los Angeles, and but... I was just as surprised as anyone else when when he read in the newspaper he bought a church in in a small town in outside of, of St. John's, right? Yeah, yeah. Did I say that right? St. John's? Yeah, you, you, you absolutely nailed you, it. You can't say St. John's. No, St. John's. St. John's. You also Saint say John's. Toronto uh, like I do too. Okay. If people say Toronto and all that stuff. Yeah. You say Toronto like I do. Yeah. And I get a hard time for it. Oh, do you? Yeah, I do anyway. So, uh, <laughs> Not here, you won't. <laughs> thank you, buddy. <laughs> so, so you, Greg Wells, again, let me point out this again, one of the most in-demand music makers of our time around the world anywhere. You know, again, Adele, mm. Taylor Swift. 
Keith Urban. I didn't know he played in your band for a while. He did at 17. He knocked on the door. I was married at the time and uh, I was out. And, and when I came home, uh, my wife at the time said, this guy, really pushy guy knocked on the door. I don't know how he found out where you lived. And he says he wants to play in the band and uh, <laughs> he's going to come back. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of weird. And, and so he did and he introduced himself. He was just a kid. He was 17 years old. And so I gave him a really tough audition, really tough. I said, okay, here, I want you to play organ on this, but there's also a, a very intricate bass line um, a, a, in the song. I said, learn the bass line too on your left hand. So I thought a couple of weeks later, he'll, he said, I'll give him a, I said, come back in a couple of weeks. And he calls me the next day, he goes, I'm ready. Next day. And he, and he nailed it. It was like in the pocket. It was, it was so insane. And, and first gig, we was like, okay, you're in the band. Do you have a van? <laughs> you're in the band. If you have a van, you're in the Kim Mitchell band. That's all. That's all it takes. Um, and then he picks up guitar and he plays drums. Amazing. He's a multi instrumentalist, and I'm just really happy to see him turn into what I would call quote unquote big stuff in Los Angeles. Craig Wells' name means a lot. So what's the story? How did? How does he? How does he come back to you to make this new record? Okay. Um, I had a health issue. I had a heart attack. And you doing all right was, now? Pardon? Are you doing okay? Yeah. Now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I am very much. Thank you. You look good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, he he was visiting some people in Peterborough. Yeah. Some friends and just on his way out, I live in Etobicoke out by the airport. Not not right by the airport, but a few minutes. And he, and he says, hey man, I got some time to kill. You want to go for a walk? And we went for this long walk. And at the end of the walk, I gave him the key of the USB key of shame. And I just went, ah, I don't like doing this because I'm sure you get this like, a million times, Greg, but I said, I have been writing some stuff. And so just, if you can give me feedback on one tune, that'd be great and be awesome. And he sent me a message a couple weeks later and went, man, I love every song you gave me. Like, please come to Los Angeles and let's record this. And I said, Greg, come on. You're like big stuff here. I, I can't afford you. He goes, nah, don't worry about that. We'll talk about that later. He goes, come on down for a week. And I'm like, a week? He goes, yeah, yeah, well, let's get it going here. Wow. So. And it was just a beautiful experience, him and I in the studio. And he played drums on, on most. Of the, well, he played drums on all the album. Ah, man, that's meaningful. It's you obviously, you obviously had a big impact on him. I know you're not the kind of fellow who's going to do that, but he, you had a big impact on him for him to do that. He you? he mentioned that. Um, and you you can't take even though he's been in Los Angeles a long time. He has six kids now. You you can't take the Canada out of him because. On um, one take, I did a guitar thing and I went, oh, I'm really sorry I messed that up. He goes, whoa, whoa. He goes, wait a minute. He says, let me be the insecure Canadian here. <laughs> <laughs> let me be the insecure he Canadian said, for you. You're an American now. He says, you, you, have, to, you have to do it like, the, like we do in America. He says, you have to go, well, listen to that, man. Wasn't that great? Aren't I fantastic? <laughs> like, I won't be any better ever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen to something from the record. Take a listen to this. The freeway dream. Take us higher and higher Skip the end of the line up Straight through the sky That's my guest, the Canadian rock icon Kim Mitchell with a little bit of the track Too Up To Be Down from his latest album, The Big Fantasize. We chose that one because it kind of has everything in it and mm. kind of shows everything that the album is. The album's there's some beautiful ballads on this uh, yeah, album. There's yeah. some beautiful quiet acoustic moments. Then there's, I mean, the showcase of your great guitar playing. There's great kind of party rock anthems. What were you interested in exploring on this record? Well, actually, that was sort of the one that was out of place for me, was uh, Too Up To Be Down, because most of it was more atmospheric, Yeah, uh, the material I had. So I, I wasn't trying to do anything other than, you know, as Greg says, all we're doing here, man, is getting it to where we love it. Yeah, And the, and when we can get it to that, that's all you're going to do for a song. And, and we want to have a good song, of course, but he liked the songs already. I just wanted a more atmospheric record. I didn't want I'm a Wild Party. Yeah. I don't want rock and roll duty anymore. I'm kind of, I'm not going to say I'm done with that stuff, but I've done it. And I had all this more atmospheric stuff laying around. And, and he, that was what, he, what interested him in the record. He goes, I like this and this and this and this and this. He says, because you do this really well. You do Diamonds, Diamonds, a Max Webster tune. You do On the Road. You do 
um, easy to tame, all we are, yeah. this stuff. He says, you do that stuff really well. He says, I think your your audience really needs to hear more of that from you. Uh, and he said, and let's, let's do it, he said, because I really love it. So. We're going to talk about some of that stuff later on, and we're going to talk about some of the early Max. Later on? How later long on. am I here for, Tom? You got, you got about four and a half more hours, Kim. <laughs> oh, You're gee, all right. okay, so, well, so get... when are we ordering lunch? <laughs> <laughs> That's supplied, right? Yeah, yeah no, of course. Because oh, if not, because I'm calling my son, I'm telling him, hey, did they not get the ride? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we actually didn't get the writer, so okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Do you, um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want. Does having a, a heart incident change what you write songs about? No. No? no I didn't, didn't Nothing really more, get... you know, existential or anything like that? No, no. You, you have the, you know, the normal stuff of reevaluating what you're doing, what you're eating, how you're living your life, what could have caused this, but um, yeah. No, I, I, when it can't, comes to music, it's just it's the same process. You're waiting for this. I, I always look at myself, Tom, as I'm the song's roadie. Yeah. It's, it's kind of come from somewhere else, and it's come through me, uh, and, and it's just saying, do this. And it, it's kind of like oh, when musicians go, yeah, I came up with this part, and it's like, I didn't come up with any of the parts. The song was telling me what parts were needed. Yeah. Okay, go here. No, that's not working. Okay, okay, that's it. Yeah, and then okay, you're done. That's all. That's all it needs. So I always look at songwriting like that. I, did I just answer your question? Or yeah, did I just wander off. That, that feels like a bit spiritual there, Kim. It yeah, feels like a. It feels like something's coming. There's to a you few there. musicians think like that. I think maybe Neil Young might. Dylan, um, Bob Dylan says that. Yeah, I had a run in with Bob Dylan once. Is that true? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Well, it doesn't matter. We, I thought we were going for a break or something. What happened? What happened? Oh, it was just uh, Memphis. I was recording an, an album called Itch. And so I'm spending big American bucks down there and at Arden Studios, a beautiful studio with Joe Hardy, who worked with ZZ Top. And so almost sounded great. And we're finishing up in the main studio. And Bob Dylan all of a sudden comes into the smaller studio. Wow. Yeah, he's, you know, and, and I go down, you know, every once in a while you leave the studio, go down to the TV room or you go to the lounge or you're, you know, and all, there's security everywhere all of a sudden. They're like, sorry, you can't come down here. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He says, yeah, Bob Dylan's here. So I said, I don't, that's okay, great, awesome, but I'm working in this studio and I want to go to the TV lines. Well, we had to get the studio owner, call him on the phone, Joe Hardy, and, and they said, look, come on, like, you know, this guy's from Canada. He's, he's spending more than probably, Dylan's probably getting the studio time for free, right? <laughs> it's like, we have Bob Dylan, we have bragging rights, but this Canadian guy, well, we're just going to make him pay double. Um, <laughs> So they, they kind of cleared the area, and then the, it went to the hotel, um, and I saw him. He was in the same hotel, kind of coming out the balcony. But uh, the next day, the next morning, the, my producer, Joe Hardy, he went into the studio and took the microphone off of the stand and did something with it and then put it back on. And, okay, good, yeah. good, good. But you, did, did, you get to, did you get to talk to Bob or anything? I did not get to talk to him, but I, you're not supposed to look at him apparently. I don't, I don't know. But, uh, well, imagine if I was okay. like, he's Sorry, here, was, right? here was, he is right now. Here okay, well, I, okay, hey, Bob. <laughs> it wasn't me that did that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's play some more music. Take a listen to this. So that's I Am a Wild Party, Go for a Soda, and Rock and Roll Duty. And Kim, we, we chose to yeah. play the live versions of all these yeah, songs. Yeah, thank you. Because I think that speaks to how a lot of Canadians would think about how they would know you best, you know, which they is do. showing up in their community with your band, putting on one that, one hell of a show. Tom, you, you really nailed it there because my royalty checks dictate that they don't actually have the albums, but they do come to these shows. <laughs> so you're right. They know the live stuff. I'm just kidding about that. Uh, but the, 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 I, I, you said this one thing one time that I really, I love when musicians talk like this. You said something like, um, what I do is customer service. Customer service and rock and roll. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, there's a few artists out there that don't like to Oh, I'm going to do side two of my new record. Or uh, I have heard, I don't know if this is fact, but Sinead O'Connor won't do her big hit. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, no, I'm all done with that. Come on, man. You, you know, 
these are the people out there that afforded you the lifestyle that you have and they they've paid money to come hear these tunes so play them and there are, for me i look at it like every one of these songs are my kids it's i'm happy to play play them as often as you want me to hear them or as often as you want to hear them and when we get bored of something well during sound checks we'll let stuff morph into i always let the band i always enjoy that when things start to morph into a little bit different territory and patio lantern certainly sounds a little bit different live but it's still the same song as soon as i start the opening line people are like oh there's patio lanterns but they kind of don't recognize it at first um that's what i loved about seeing robert plant with with his new deal you know doing I mean, he'll be like four minutes into a led zeppelin tune before you know it's a zeppelin tune right? <laughs> so cool man wow where did that come from in you to to have because now you're right not every musician has that mentality where did that where do you think that comes from in you what part the part that doesn't matter it doesn't matter um what i find interesting it doesn't matter like i'm not going to keep the people oh. out there are here to hear this music yeah because it's I look at them and they're having such a great time and that's what I'm here to do, customer service and rock and roll. It's kind of not about me, it's about them. Um, and I don't know where that came from, but, because uh, I, I, you know, I enjoy, I get I get my licks in, I get my guitar playing on, I get to enjoy, it's, there's, it's all about transmitting an energy, uh, communicating with whoever is on stage with you and that that musical energy blasting out to an audience and they pick up on that. When you see that happening, that's like a beautiful thing. It doesn't matter whether you're right or left or what you believe in or don't believe in. Music in this room right now is bringing us happiness. And to me, that's like one of the coolest jobs in the world. I, I have been so lucky, man. I almost fill up when I think of how lucky I've been to um, do that for people. And it was actually a doctor who told me that. I was like, wow, look at this stuff on the wall that you've done. And he's like, don't ever discount what you've done, man, like f for your music career. Like you bring happiness to all these people every night. Not easy all the time. I mean, no. you, I've seen, I've seen your tour runs before and mm -hmm. a lot of Canada in the winter. Uh, yeah, that's less now, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I can still remember first time being a little kid in, in the winter and the, the equipment's in a van and we get a flat tire and we're emptying the van and we don't have a jack and we have to lift up the we're lifting the van up while, no. the, while the one roadie we had put the truck tire on <laughs> and what does he do he puts it on you know reverse so we have to pull it lift it up again and put it paid my dues i bet i bet those early days you guys were you guys were oh yeah i can think of other things too man. when living on king street the whole band leaving um this is max, Web max webster yeah max webster no no uh, before Max Webster, just moving to Toronto at 17 and um, the fridge was outside the back door because the landlord wouldn't buy us a fridge. So the band had to break up in spring because we couldn't keep, like really, they all went back to Sarnia. And I, <laughs> doesn't that sound odd? The fridge, the fridge the broke The fridge down. was off, out the back door. So one of those yeah. old Victorian row houses in Toronto. Yeah. And yeah, the fridge is out back. So during the winter, we're we're cool. We're okay. We're we're eating, and there's food in there. And I'm telling you, the food wasn't great. Yeah. And and there's four guys next to us living living with us uh, next door that were just out of the Don Jail. So, and and lucky they came over one night. And the only thing we had, they were like, "We need drinks." And I said, "The only thing I have is aftershave." So they took some of that, and but they became our friends. They were like, if anybody bothers you, because we were jamming in like all hours of the day, they were yeah. practicing. So they could have said, "Knock it off," and yeah. we would have had to. But they went, "Oh man, it's great." And then the and then the fridge breaks down and everyone has to go home. Fridge breaks to down the food anymore. And, yeah, that's right. It's like, well, what are we gonna eat? Go home. And everybody's like, "Well, I'm going home." And I stayed. <laughs> And I got to know Jack Richardson, uh, who was producing the Guess Who, and he got me a bit of work. So, so in Sarnia, when you first picked up the guitar, what kind of stuff were you playing? On top of Old Smokey. Yeah, good song, by the way. Yeah. People, yeah. people, um, people laugh at that song. It's a very sad song. Mm -hmm. uh, a false-hearted lover is worse than a thief. Okay, I. You tell me, because you know that song. 
Well, I played it on guitar and, and that was sort of, you're asking me what I was learning and it was like on top of old smoke and stuff like that. I think I'm, then, over, over, I'm overthinking it a little bit. Can I, you yeah, you might be going a little deeper than what I was doing <laughs> at 11 years old, Tom. <laughs> well, okay, so then when, when do you start shredding? When do you start getting good well, at the electric the, guitar? Oh, well, I didn't start shredding. Um, I, I've lived on a Greek island quickly, backing up a Greek Tom Jones, and then when I came back, I formed Max Webster to take guitar lessons. Not to form Max Webster, but to make 150 bucks a week so I could study from a specific teacher in Toronto. But there's not like you're 14 years old in Sarnia and you realize I might be pretty good at the guitar here? No, no. I mean, I, I was in bands in Sarnia. What kind of stuff were you guys doing? We were doing original stuff, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, at 15, 16, 17. We opened up for the MC5. I don't know whether you've ever heard of them. The legendary Detroit punk band MC5. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where was that? Yeah. In that Sarnia? just gave me more cred, didn't it? <laughs> well, it's true. No, listen, like, who opens up this, for the MC5? Look at this the, jean jacket. The old Smokey did it for me. Okay, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, So you opened up for MC5 in the, what, in the 70s? Uh, well, no, that would be the sixties. This is, this isn't, this isn't Max Webster. This is my kid's band. And we got asked to do, uh, a show. It was in, uh, Kellogg college, wherever that was, would that be somewhere in Michigan? Yeah. I believe. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we got to open up for the MC five. We shared the same dressing room. It was just a classroom. One of the classrooms, they came in with what they called that back then the MC5 Stompers, which were their girlfriends, which they kept the other girls away from their band members, their guys, and they made all their clothes. And uh, it was just this, this culty, beautiful thing. And and uh, National Guard surrounded the whole perimeter no. of, of the gig. Yeah. Because yeah. dangerous. It was, they were a punk band. It was dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we ripped it up right before MC5. I can't believe there's been some scary shows. Probably the scariest one was opening up for Black Sabbath in Leeds, but what happened there? I just I'd never seen an audience like that before. You're, I remember standing on the stage and and when the audience came in, they're just running. It's just a bunch of I'd never seen piercings or a tattoo or anything. It was just like all that was going on back then. I was like, and I I went into the dressing room and went, "We're gonna die tonight. Like we're not gonna make it through the the set." And we did okay. This is Max Webster. Max Webster, yeah. Man, oh man. Yeah. So, so this this Greece thing. So you you travel to Greece when mm -hmm. you're a kid yep. to be a musician for the Greek Tom Jones. That's right. What was yeah. his name? Uh, Alex Kousanokoulos. Uh, Agapitos. Uh, Alex would be Agapitos in Greece. Agapitos Kousanokoulos. And uh, yeah, I was going to go back to school and uh, keyboard friend, player friend of mine said, hey, do you want to play in a show band? I'm like, what's a show band? I don't even know what that is. He said, well, we play like clubs like for a week. I'm like, okay, what are we talking about? He's got like 150 bucks a week. I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. So I didn't go back to school and played in Ontario and Quebec and stuff like that with uh, this Alex Kuzinikolas. And was, he thought he was Tom Jones and I'm not going to tell him he's not. Yeah. But he was actually a good guy. He was talented. He did it well. It's kind of like one of the early tribute bands. Is that like Hamburg for the, now you're not going to say yes to this, but is this, is this kind of like Hamburg for the Beatles in that you just start putting in the hours? Like, yeah. I like, I think uh, Lil Steven says this about the E Street Band with the mm -hmm. Bruce Springsteen's band. When they played in bars in Asbury Park, they just had to play every single night. So they got really good at playing every single night. Is that what it was? Is that what uh, for you? Well, that's, that was the way Max Webster was. We played all the time, all the time. The show band thing was more like, I'm just playing Tom Jones stuff and show band music, yeah. But did you get good really quickly? Uh, I don't know. I just remember the matching suits. <laughs> 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 they were pretty brutal. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, take okay. a listen to this. Kim Mitchell and his band Max Webster playing Beyond the Moon. I can hear like the Greece years in, yeah. in that. Am I right? You are absolutely right. Yeah, because I just got back from Greece. The opening is full on Greek. So you started to bring some of that into. Some of it leaked into my my music a little bit. Some in, in the writing. Uh, there's another song uh, off that album. Was uh, I actually okay? When I was in Greece, yeah, you hear Greek music. And the thing that puzzled me about Greek music were their ballads. 
which you know that there's a bar of four mm -hmm. and there's a bar of five. Like, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. One. one took two, a while for me to figure that out. And there were, but uh, I gravitated more towards Arabic music. I thought it was really vibey and, ooh, just uh, reached in real deep in there and walking around Greece with a little radio with one little earpiece in mono and, um, Radio Free Europe and stuff like that. But when I did get back, yeah, that, that, that's a direct Greek. So when you, when you go back home and, and Max Webster starts up, what, like what's, what's the goal? Is the goal to make, you know, sort of interesting... To become famous. Yeah? Was that really it? <laughs> no. It could be. Some people no, do. No, no. The, the purpose was for me to take guitar lessons from, from a gentleman named Tony Braden. I wanted to take guitar lessons and kind of really take a, a good shot at learning. And I heard he was an amazing private teacher. And I thought, well, private teacher's way to go. I need to uh, play in a band. So we got this band, Max Webster, together. And we started to play the bars and stuff like that. And um, it's pretty out there music, man. Like, yeah. You know? Well, let's first, we, at first, Tom, we were doing a lot of cover stuff. We were doing like David Bowie stuff and a little bit of Frank Zappa because I really liked Frank Zappa. And yeah. of course, there's the tune out factor. That's when everybody would get up and go to the washroom in some <laughs> bar and be like, where's everybody going while we play Peaches on Regalia? Yeah, 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 yeah. Also known as Smoke Break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, then you could smoke inside. Oh, you're uh, right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, yeah, we just ended up, Max Webster started to do better and better and better. And eventually we went on the our first cross Canada tour with Rush and then Styx. And that's when Dennis DeYoung, I always remember being on a boat with Dennis DeYoung and you know, you're going across to the island and you're uh, leaning against the thing, watching the beautiful scenery comes by and Dennis DeYoung comes up and he's like, he hasn't said anything to you the whole tour yet. We're doing a few days, he goes, you like Frank Zappa? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I kind of do. He goes, I didn't notice. And he walked away. <laughs> you know, now if that, if now was then or then was now, I would have turned it. What? Do you like Liberace? <laughs> right, was it hard? Was it hard to, when that band stops? I guess what I want to know is what happens to you when your first big band stops? You move to the beaches in Toronto and you start writing. Uh, you take a break. I was just burned out creatively. I was pretty burned out. Yeah. Um, we were Russia's little brother and I, I didn't see, I, I always thought, which was great. And we were getting to the point, we were sort of on, when I think back, we were starting to get something going. Like, we played Hammersmith only on a couple times and we were going to go back and headline the next time. And stuff like that was starting to happen. So had we stuck with it, maybe, but I was just kind of creatively burned out. I just reached to a first time in my life where I went, I have to go home. I'm curious about this. When you write songs with Max Webster versus writing songs with Kim Mitchell as yourself, Kim Mitchell has so much more choruses and bridges and pop songs, you know, great in the best possible use of the word, like Thank pop you. rock songs. Not really what you were doing with Max Webster as That's much. Right. How do you learn how to do that? How you, do you learn how to write choruses and all that? You sim Simply, you get a songwriting lesson from Rick Emmett. And that's what changed me. L Rick sat down with me one day. I hadn't spoke to him. We, we share the same birthday. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, Kim... He goes, um, do you, Max Webster's like, it's really a cool band. Like your music is really cool. He says, but do you like know what a B verse is and a bridge and a, do you know what a, you know, chorus is? And I'm like, no, not really. So he went through the songwriting formatics of the parts of a song. And that was my biggest songwriting lesson. And that's when stuff kind of changed for me. Rick Emmett from Triumph, right? That's right, <laughs> Rick. Rick, yeah. Man, oh man! Yeah, and then the, then those songs just start coming out of you. Like yeah, something just, obviously clicks. Something is the next time I started sitting down writing, I started turning out stuff that actually had a chorus in it. And I wasn't chasing after radio. I wasn't chasing after anything. I just was like, how do I become a better songwriter? Okay, well I'll try this. And like, yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. A B verse builds tension into this part of the song, and then that makes that present better. And then, 
And then the bridge is is supposed to be an alternative, you know, chords and harmony and different lyric content. One of the best bridges ever is is in the song Tina Turner, What's Love Got to Do With It? And then when she goes, I've been thinking about a new... That's a, that's a beautiful yeah. bridge. It's like, okay, there, okay. I kind of see how this is done. Are you... I love uh, something, the bridge and something by the Beatles. Yeah. You're asking me with my love goes. No, I, I don't, don't know. know. Yeah. I and no, you, no, no, you no. don't always have to have that stuff, but it's nice to be going through that little checklist. Like, does this song need this? Does it not need it? When do you start realizing that it's starting to happen in Canada? Like, when do you start to realize that these songs you're writing with guidance from Rick, like just on how to write a pop song, when do you start? Because that first album gets really big really quickly. Mm -hmm. when, do you, when do you start to realize that coming at it? Because most people don't even get the first band success. Most people don't even get Max Webster. When do you realize that, that Kim Mitchell's music is starting to, starting to happen, starting to work? Um, it kind of didn't even notice it. It just kind of kept playing and gigs got a bit bigger and it wasn't like, okay, you're doing good. Go out and buy a sports car. No, <laughs> no. There was none of that. It was just sort of, oh, okay, so we're going to play that arena and that sold out. Okay. And then we're going to do this and then we're, oh, we're going down to the States and we're going to play with this band and, oh, we're doing some dates with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Oh, we're going to do leads and stuff like that with, with Rush and with Black Sabbath and so many American bands I've played with and I, you know so I'm starting to realize okay things are starting to happen here okay and all of a sudden you're getting a royalty check and it's like okay that's pretty good and stuff like that. It so. must feel validating after the band stops you know it must feel mm -hmm. validating after yeah Max Webster for, for it to start to work inside of you you know. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. I mean, I was just grateful that it's starting to look like I could have this for a career for a little longer. I mean, that's all you're kind of. I mean, you really are starting at ground zero every time, right? Every album, every song. So just get it to where you love love it. There's only twelve notes, man. So <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about that twelve notes in a second. But uh, I want to talk about. Um, so Max Webster starts since 1972, so 50th anniversary. You got a 70th birthday happening as well. But you were also inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame last year. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was supposed to be 2020, but then because of COVID, it got moved yeah. to 2021. Um, from a fella who, um, you know, like everyone moved out because the fridge broke down um, and opening for the MC5 in a, in a college with the National Guard around you. What does it mean to be inducted into that hall of fame that one blew my mind yeah uh, yeah it blew my mind when i got a call um from the socan people and when they said that i was like wait a minute are you are you sure like they say yeah we want to induct your your whole body of work too not just uh, a couple songs or this song that blew my mind i i must say that you know you get with platinum and gold records and stuff like that in canada i'm i'm I've done okay in Canada. As far as the rest of the world, it's kind of like, eh, you know. But, uh, and I've made a career out of this, so uh, I'm so grateful of that. But uh, when, that, when that came along, I was like, wow, because I started thinking about other people that are in there, and I was like, man. Leonard Cohen, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Bruce Coburn. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> first thing I think of, I'm a self-deprecating guy, so the first thing I think of is like, okay, I'd like a group picture with these people. Would they know who I am? <laughs> like, who's this Kim Mitchell guy? Or, is it a girl? Because <laughs> I, I run into that in the States. I go to a record store back in the day and say, hey, have you got any Kim Mitchell? I go, well, I don't know who she. <laughs> what, what, what does she play? I'm like, okay, well. I, yeah. think, I, I mean, I admit that when I was a kid, I thought you were Max Webster. Mm -hmm. I've been called Max. Still yeah. do once in a while. Yeah. That's okay. I answer to it. They might know you from, it was, wasn't go for a soda in a mad, like a Mothers Against Drunk yeah, Driving commercial? That's right, yeah. That must have been meaningful to you, to you too. It was, it was. And the song is not about that, Tom. It's it's about two people in conflict. So you're in one of your blue moods. You want to have it your way and I want it mine. All this debating going around in a blue moon makes me thirsty for love. Yeah. It's another way of saying, ah, let's forget it. We're not getting anywhere. Let's go for Mine, soda. Let's go for soda. Um, but when they said, oh, Remember, you're in the States, and, and, and they're going, oh, yeah, Mother's Against Drunk Driving, they've adopted your song from... I say, and I just kind of went, well, 
that's amazing. Like, that's totally cool. I said, it's not about that. They said, don't say that. <laughs> don't, don't say that ever. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's what I always thought it was about. I thought it was about, you know. My memory of Gopher Soda in the States is that Twisted Sister, we're not going to take it, came out the same time. We're on the same label. And it was like one of those, uh, the, like one of those games where the horse gets a little further and then the next one goes up. But we're not going to take it? And, yeah, and we're not going to take it and go for so. Okay, go for so, start to do really well. And then, oh, we're not going to take it. And then all of a sudden, not, we're not going to take it. gets a little bit too good. And, and then they just go for so, it goes. <laughs> <laughs> It's still a big song. I mean, I think I heard it over the weekend. Like it still gets played to this day. I played you know? it over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Um, can we talk about another song? Sure. Uh, from those early days. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned All We Are uh, recently. So it's a it's a beautiful song. It's from your, your um, from your first record. Here's what I find really interesting about the song, and we were talking about this on the show, is that I don't meet a lot of performers and musicians like you that will go through it with teamwork in the way that some of your songs are written. So it's you and Pai Dubois and Peter Fredette, Fredette, right? Peter Fredette, yeah. And three of you seem to come together to make this song together. Can you talk to me a little bit about, about All We Are, a little bit about how that song came sure. together? Sure, yeah, I can. Um, my head bought a keyboard and that's where I wrote it on it. Um, and I don't play keyboard very well, but I sat there with it hours and hours and hours because I loved it. and and started to, I came up with the verses of All We Are. And, and Pi had lyrics, these lyrics, All We Are is all that love brings. And we spin as our star, star spins. He didn't have the chorus. And I started going, well, it needs this, it needs this. And then Pi came up with, oh, how about this? Don't ask me if I'm still in love. So I'm going, ask me if I'm still in love. But then I realized, no, I, I'm, it's not in my register. And I didn't know how to change the key on the keyboard. So I thought, well, you know what, I'll just shelve this song till maybe one day I'll get a, a girl in the band or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just shelved it and then um, in the studio recording a mini, al a mini album and, and uh, uh, this other musician from Ottawa, I said, yeah, if I, I said, I have this other great song. If I only had somebody who could sing it, I can't sing it because it's too high. And he goes, I know somebody. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I know a guy in Ottawa. His name's Peter Fredette. He's a beautiful singer. I said, okay, well, let's get him down. He came down and he sang, and I was just like, wow, okay. Let's make the deal right here. We shook hands. I said, Peter, I'll yell, you sing. So, <laughs> and um, and that's kind of when we decided we would start doing that song. And and it it was just hilarious that 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 how well I mean he is the song for for me. You know, I mean, um, and when you speak about Pai Dubois, I'm his biggest fan. I was his biggest fan. I thought the way he jammed around with the English language was great. And I, you know, anyone listening, stories are nice in lyrics, but Pi worked with images. It was always about images. It was always about creating pictures. It wasn't necessarily about a story. Um, you know, I'm hit by this song I sing because you made me feel such a long way away. That's not really a story. It's they're setting up the image of that, what someone did to this person and how you feel. And, Ah, it's it's cool. I'm just a big fan of it. So I mean, I do get a sense of, um, I guess, like a sense of egolessness off you. You know what I mean? Like, there, I don't know many rock stars and people who play shows the way you do who would be willing to share vocal space with someone like Peter, share lyrics with someone like Pi. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I do. The only time I pull the Kim Mitchell card is if I have to wait in line at a restaurant. And I'm like, hey, go up and tell them who's... No, I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Like, there is... Yeah. yeah. Well, it... When you have someone like Peter in the band, you, you use it, man, and and it it's been great. He's he's been a great friend, and we're we're just like brothers from another mother, man. It's just like it's he's like four decades now, and he he almost got into Shania Twain's band. Uh, she auditioned him and and brought him down to the states. And I tell this story on stage because I'm introducing him sometimes. Where she opened up the studio door. You know, to greet him, and she didn't even say hello. She just started singing "All We Are." Oh and, wow! And I was just like, that was so touching, you know. So yeah, I mean, your music means a lot to a lot of people, including a new generation of Canadian musicians. I mean, I've heard stories that like, you have new fan, new fans still showing up to the shows, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. With with Max Webster albums too. Like, you know, I'll see young kids as young as 
nineteen twenty something, and they're holding up the first Max Webster debut album. I'm like, what? You know, well, sorry that your parents did that to you, really. <laughs> well, Ed, Ed Robertson from Bare Naked Ladies, he told me that he had uh, he had his parents make him a Max Webster jacket or something like that. He sh- he showed up at the Max Webster video for All We Are. He was in the audience. He's like, I was in the audience. <laughs> and he had a Max Webster. He had written it on his pencil case. And oh, maybe. Yeah. He was the one who got me into you guys. Like, oh, okay. He, he was the guy who was like, you know. It was like, his fault. I'll have to yeah. call him in. <laughs> Why did you do that to another person? <laughs> <laughs> and now I saw that you're opening dates for Bare Naked Ladies. You guys are playing the we, Budweiser stage. Playing Budweiser stage. And then now uh, Western big, Vancouver. Big, huge stage in Toronto and a big, yeah. huge stage in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do that. What does that mean for you to be able to... To have these artists who you influenced, you know, take you out on the road and 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 give a bit of gratitude back. Well, to you. it's lovely. We're all just we're all just doing the same thing, man. We're you know, um, just the numbers are different for them. Come on, uh, though, that's meaningful to have oh, this guy who's had your, you know. Oh yeah, for sure, sure. It's it's great. I've played Budweiser stage before. I played, well, uh, Def Leppard was there with them. Um, I think maybe. Bachman Cummings when they were sure, um, but I'm looking forward to this because they're 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 cool guys and they're friends and they love you. Oh yeah, they they do, and I love them, and I just love them. I, I just, they're such great musicians, and um, when they when they go at it, it's like wow, it sounds amazing, and that's I, I love it. It's great. He told me a great story that one time Neil Young talked to them backstage after they played, and he went yeah. up to him and said, "You guys are like the Marx Brothers or something." <laughs> <laughs> Did he say yeah, that? Yeah. Oh man. That's my best Neil Young impression, by the that way. That was good. Thank you. That was good. Uh, before we go, I want to close off with something you said last year when you were being inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. You had a message for anyone getting started. Take a listen to this. I want to let you know that there's 12 notes and they're there for absolutely everyone to enjoy and have fun with at any age or any skill level. So uh, do it often, do a lot of it, and be fearless. And get your music to where you love it, and I swear you'll find an audience, whether it be large or small. Was that philosophy with you from the beginning, or is that something that happened over time? That happened over time, yeah. And I can't add to it, because that's exactly how I feel. And how, how do you I learn? Think, how I feel that other yeah. musicians who don't get uptight about making it, take, you know, parents come up, hey, What's my daughter need to do to, to make it? It's like, take the word making it right out of it. Do that, what I just said. When, when did you learn that? You said you learned it over time. When did you think you learned that? Uh, well, I learned it a little bit during Max Webster, and then I learned a lot more about it during my solo career. And then when Greg Wells came into the uh, pitcher to do the big fantasize one day, I said something about a song uh, we were recording, and he goes, whoa, stop. I said, like, hey, how about if we do this? He goes, whoa, wait a minute, stop. He goes, that sounds, that doesn't sound like you. That sounds like someone you've been talking to has told you that this was what the song, and he says, right now there's you and I in here, and we're going to get it to where we love it, and that's all. I'm just going to get this song to where you get excited and you love it. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's really what it's about, because there's always going to be somebody more successful. Not everybody's here to, to become, you know, to be in the NHL. But you can sure play hockey and really enjoy it and get really good at it. Do you still practice? I do. Yeah. Not not like I used to, but yeah, I have to because I've been off for a couple of years. And when you get on stage, it's like, whoa, did I just play that like that? <laughs> what did you used to do? You used to do like seven, eight hours a day, that kind of thing? No, no, I never did that. I, tops, I would do four hours a day. And yeah. that's hard to do. Oh, yeah. It's hard to do, man. Uh, you still... Life is busy. Yeah. What keeps you on the road? It's even when you're about to turn 70, what's, what's keeping uh, you on the road? Well, the fact that I haven't done it for a couple of years, I really missed it after a while. And it's what I do and there's people still coming out and I love seeing them enjoy themselves. Any plans for the 70th birthday? You going to celebrate it all? I'm tr- I'm not turning 70. I've been 39 for decades, Tom. <laughs> okay, it's no big deal, man. <laughs> yeah, you don't celebrate a 39th birthday. Well... <laughs> You, you do it once, and yeah. then you just, I've been 39 for decades, I just stop. Man, I got to tell you, you, we've been, happy birthday. Thank you. And we've been looking forward to having you in for so long. Well, Tom, I'm, I'm a fan of yours as well. I'm, you know. Well, it's nice to have yeah, you. I'm man. a fan of yours. Great King work. Mitchell. Congratulations yeah, you, on, your, on your successful radio career, man. 